Every human male and female has a set of biological gender signals, but the cultures in which they live can't leave these alone. They modify them in a thousand different ways, exaggerating some and suppressing others, changing them and making them more and more elaborate, translating the biological language of sex into a complex cultural adventure. Today, when human beings display their genders, it's no longer a simple matter. Instead of quietly transmitting their basic reproductive signals, they noisily proclaim their adult status with all the complexity that modern life can offer them. We've fine-tuned ourselves to take into account a thousand tiny details when we set eyes on a member of the opposite sex performing lightning calculations to assess their sex appeal. A study made in 200 different cultures to establish what was considered especially appealing identified hardly any qualities that were found everywhere. For every culture that focused on one particular feature, there was another one that was obsessed with some other part of the body. Usually, these features were exaggerations of one or other of the many human gender signals. The physical features which distinguish us most clearly as male or female transmit the strongest signals. For example, the female neck is longer, more slender, more swan-like than the male neck. It follows that a long, slim neck is an intensely feminine feature, and that anything which can increase or emphasize this feature will increase the femininity of the gender display. And nothing could be more feminine than these Russian ballerinas whose rigorous training sessions develop body postures that seem to give them the longest necks in the world. But not quite. One culture has taken this particular gender signal to even greater extremes. The giraffe-necked women of the Padang people from eastern Burma start putting solid brass rings round their necks when they're very young. As they grow, they add more and more rings, which push their shoulders down further and further. By the time they're adult, they possess the longest female necks in the entire world. The dream of each woman is to reach the maximum number of 32 rings, although few manage to achieve this goal. Traditionally, the custom was explained as protection against attack by tigers. But today, Padang women give a simpler explanation. Wearing brass rings round your neck makes you beautiful. As with all extreme forms of beauty, there's a price to pay. In this case, it's the heavy weight the women must carry on their bodies throughout their adult lives, and the lack of flexibility when they perform their household duties. Throughout history, human societies have taken the biological sex differences and wildly exaggerated them, trying to improve on nature, one culture concentrating on one part of the body, while another selects something else. For instance, women have smaller feet than men, so if you can produce a super small foot, you can produce a super feminine foot. Nothing illustrates this more vividly than this ancient Chinese shoe. And believe it or not, this was not the shoe of a tiny child, but of a fully adult Chinese woman, despite its minute size. And it was a woman who had suffered the excruciating pain of traditional Chinese foot binding. As a small girl, maybe only six or seven, her mother would have insisted on her going to the foot binder, and there she'd have had her foot crushed. It was done with a long tape, about two inches wide and about 10 feet long, and it was wrapped round and round her tiny foot. 
The toes, the four smaller toes, were curled underneath. The big toe was left straight. And then in a figure of eight, it was wrapped round the heel, pulling the sole and heel together until the foot was crushed up tight. And as the years passed, this tiny hoof-like foot became permanently deformed. The woman could never run again. She could only totter along on these tiny feet. But it gave her a very high status. And it made the foot very sexually exciting to Chinese men. The foot was known as the golden lotus, and it became the focus of erotic longing. During lovemaking, men would touch it, caress it, kiss it, suck it, and even put the whole foot inside their mouth as part of the erotic foreplay of love. This custom lasted nearly a thousand years, from the 10th century to the beginning of the 20th, when it was at last stamped out as cruel and barbaric. But although the custom is gone and the pain has stopped, these exquisite relics remain in all their delicate beauty. Like the Chinese ladies of yesterday, modern women prefer shoes that are as small as possible. They may not go so far as foot crushing, but they intuitively recognize the femininity of a small foot. And there's an old saying in the shoe trade that if a shoe is attractive, it doesn't fit. Not only are Western shoes worn too tight, they're also frequently worn in a shape that distorts normal locomotion. Fashionably high-heeled shoes interfere with the balance of the body. Like the Chinese shoes, they make the walk of the wearer more precarious, more vulnerable, and therefore more likely to arouse the protective instincts of the human male. The medical price paid for this particular form of feminine appeal includes, in extreme cases, skin calluses, cramped toes, sprained ankles, strained backs, and shortened calf muscles. But no one ever promised that gender exaggeration was going to be easy. Another body zone available for gender amplification is the mouth. On average, the human female has larger lips than the male. Not only this, but her already generous lips further increase their size when she becomes sexually aroused. And the echo of the female's facial and genital lips is an important sexual signal. During sexual arousal, both become swollen and redder because they're engorged with blood. If it's sexy for a woman to have large red lips, then exaggerating their size and color should make them even sexier. And since ancient Egyptian times, women have drawn attention to their lips with bright lipstick, often extending the painted edge outside the natural lip line to make the lips appear even larger. But as a lip exaggeration, the Western application of lipstick dwindles into insignificance alongside what is done by the women of the Surma and Mercy tribes of Ethiopia. It's their aim to have the largest lips that it's humanly possible to possess. When a girl is young, a slit is cut in her lip and a small coin-sized plate is pushed inside to stretch it. As she grows older, the plate is replaced, getting bigger and bigger. The value of a young woman is determined by the size of her lip plate. And when she's ready to be married, her bride price will be fixed, depending on how large her lip plate is at that time. Tribal lip plates may seem bizarre to Western eyes, but we do have our own rather more modest version of them. We call them beasting lips. Hello. Good morning, Liz. How are you? Good, thank you. Are you all ready? I think so. For the new you? Right. New lips? Mm -hmm. For women who are prepared to undergo surgery to improve their looks, it's possible to artificially enlarge their lips to give them a permanently sexy, pouting mouth. This procedure, which involves inserting strips of fat into the flesh of the lips, may be far less dramatic than the insertion of enormous lip plates, but the basic idea is the same. Bigger lips are sexier lips. Face on, the upper lip increased by three and a half millimeters, the lower lip increased by five millimeters. Well, now what we do is you lick your lips and we can stick you to a window. <laughs> was, this a, was it as difficult as you thought it would no, be? No, it was nothing for me. Did it take the full two hours? No. No? Okay. Yeah. Have you pulled the picture? Yeah.
Did you get him? Did you look in there? Mm hmm I did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it'd be like, uh, the way he was explaining it, like a giant sea bass or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not as bad as I expected. Beautiful. You think so already, huh? Oh, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> All ready to go? I am. Much of the human female's sex appeal is related to her ability to bear children. Wide hips and a supple abdomen give promise of easy childbirth, and body movements that emphasize these qualities transmit powerful sexual signals to watching male eyes. This is the basis of the famous Turkish belly dance, performed here not as a flashy nightclub act for tourists, but as the real thing, an erotic display by Turks for Turks. In Cameroon, in tropical West Africa, where the breeding rate is high, in fact, three times as high as in North America or Europe, the ability to bear children is an even more important element of female sex appeal. So it's hardly surprising that the devices local women use to signal their breeding potential are even more exaggerated. If a large pelvis is good for giving birth, then why not help nature out by creating a super pelvis? These women are preparing for an evening out on the town by padding their skirts with cushions, to give the impression that their hips are massively wide and therefore perfect for the easiest of childbirths. The results may look clumsily heavy to Western eyes, but to the local males, these swollen contours are the height of female sexuality. If a wife is expected to have at least six children, as she is in this particular country, then these are the broad pelvic girdles through which those new babies will slide into the world with consummate ease. An alternative way to emphasize the hips is to artificially reduce the width of the waist. In earlier epochs, this was done by squeezing the female body into corsets that were so tight the women could hardly breathe. At the height of the Victorian period, some women even had their lower ribs surgically removed to create the perfect hourglass figure. The next one I want to talk about is this one. So. In the West today, however, where the breeding rate has slowed down dramatically, the preference is for a slimmer, more juvenile figure. The ideal female is no longer the voluptuous, heavy-hipped child-bearer, but the more lively, playful companion. This more slender figure needs a little help with its primeval sexual signals and finds it in a new kind of garment. Did you notice any difference in your shape? Well, other people did. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bum bra, designed to control and shape the buttocks, giving the wearer a silhouette which reinstates the sexuality of the female behind while retaining the minimum of body fat as required by contemporary fashion. But I'm just concerned that we need to perhaps lower this mm. yeah. just a fraction. I think it just needs to tuck yeah. underneath your bottom a little mm. bit more there, mm. give you just that... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, that's great. Okay. Thanks very much. Can you put the next garment on now, please? Yes, all right. Generous hips may not be popular in the West, but generous breasts are still in favour. Because the hemispherical shape of the female breast is such a powerful sexual signal for our species, it's not surprising to find that some women resort to surgery to enhance this feature. Silicone implants create breasts that are rigidly and dramatically rounded, no matter what actions their owners perform. This creates a powerful image for spectators, but whether these visually improved breasts feel sexual is another matter. In the context of the topless bar, however, this is of no importance, because here, touching is strictly taboo. 
even for those physical features where no gender differences exist, culture soon invents them. There's no biological difference, for example, between the hair that grows on the top of the head of a young adult male and that on a young adult female. Before male baldness sets in in later life, the head hair is identical in the two sexes, providing it's left alone and allowed to grow naturally. But there is hardly a human society on Earth where it gets this chance. Hairstylists are everywhere. Male hairstyles are generally shorter and simpler than those of females. This difference dates back to ancient Rome, when the Roman army cropped its hair. Cropped hair is more difficult to grab hold of in close combat. Long hair makes the wearer more vulnerable. Ever since then, a shorter hairstyle has been thought of as essentially masculine, and the more elaborate hairstyles as feminine. Societies the world over have adopted hair as a conveniently conspicuous gender signaling device. In India, where traditionally women wear their hair very long and therefore super feminine, a girl who chooses to cut her hair short is making a strong statement about herself. I'm modern, I'm independent, I'm liberated. It may have taken her years to grow her beautiful hair to this length, but now it's time for a more severe, business-like approach to life. In the West, however, where hairstyles today are highly variable and long hair is therefore not burdened with a traditional standard, its sexual appeal can be freely enjoyed by women without robbing them of their liberated image. This has led to ingenious ways of making women's hair appear longer, one of which is to have lengths of natural hair attached to the existing short hair. So, as hair is chopped ruthlessly off in the East, it's stuck delicately on in the West. In a procedure lasting anything up to four hours, specially developed glue binds the strands of human hair in place, but the effect is only temporary and will last around three months. It follows that for every person who's had their hair extended in this way, someone with long hair has chosen to make a different statement by cutting theirs short. And the significance of culture in this reciprocal arrangement is reflected by the fact that the trade in human hair is all one way. India and China are the main exporters, and the West is the only market. Even in an egalitarian military regime where cultural influences should be minimal, this artificial gender distinction is preserved. Here, where males and females are supposedly treated exactly alike, and both are required to have very short hairstyles, there's still just enough difference to distinguish female hair from male hair at a glance, even when the costumes and postures are identical. One of the qualities of longer female hair is that it's much softer and more sensuous to the touch than closely cropped male hair. This has led many societies to create a taboo against its overt display. In some cultures, the taboo has been total, no public display of female hair at any time. In others, the taboo is partial, applied only in sacred contexts. Here in St. Petersburg, the traditionally long-haired Russian women entering this Russian Orthodox church are required to cover their hair as an act of humility, although the traditionally short-haired men face no such restriction. Gender signals, even those artificially created by society, can become so potent that they have to be suppressed in non-sexual contexts.
For women living in many Middle Eastern countries, merely covering the hair is not enough. Almost every gender signal must be minimized and suppressed. These heavily veiled young women are not nuns, they're university students, screened from the world by a curtain of black cloth that completely obscures their female shape, cutting off all sexual signals from their waists, their hips, breasts, buttocks, legs, arms, hands, lips, cheeks, everything except their eyes. This is the one feature they're allowed to expose to the outside world, and even this is only permitted so that they can see where they're going. But the isolation of the eyes in this way reminds us of just how powerful this facial feature is as a signaling device. Even in cultures where it's possible to display publicly almost all the body's gender signals, the eyes retain a special significance. Eye contact is an intimate and direct form of communication between the human sexes. To maintain prolonged eye contact with a member of the opposite sex conveys a clear signal of carnal interest. Prolonged staring in any other context would be threatening, but for young lovers it is not. For them, it's an essential part of the process of pair bonding and is usually performed at very close proximity. There's a special reason for this. A device called a pupillometer measures precisely changes in the size of subjects' pupils as they view a succession of images. The size of our pupils changes according to our emotional response to the object of our gaze. If we see something we like, the pupils grow bigger, regardless of any change in light levels. But if we see something repellent, they get smaller. So when young lovers are gazing closely into one another's eyes, they're unconsciously checking one another's pupils to see if they're growing larger or smaller. If they're dilating, it must mean that the partner likes what they're seeing. And this acts as a powerful indication that someone is falling in love. And since we like people who like us, it follows that a face with dilated pupils is much more appealing to us than one with pupils that are mere pinpricks. This is why advertisers sometimes enlarge the pupils of girls in their advertisements so that we'll be more inclined to buy their products. And it's also the reason why in the past, Italian courtesans used to drop Bella Donna, which means literally beautiful lady, into their eyes to massively dilate their pupils and make themselves more appealing to their male partners. All right, so let's get started. Here we go. Well, the face is like a stage. When you have a performer on stage, what do you do? You put the spotlight on them. Because the eyes are so important in communication between the sexes, we go to great lengths to improve their appearance, to make them look bigger, wider, more colorful, and therefore more likely to attract the gaze of a member of the opposite sex, hoping that once eye contact has been made, the secret language of the pupils will begin to work its magic. Okay, go ahead and do the other side, Jamie. What you want to do is you want to open up your face and create the accent this way. Isn't that what you want to do? Yes. Right? So you want to go from the outside in. <laughs> but tissue paper is not good for your, for oh. your, lid, for your okay. the skin on your lid. <laughs> Just apply a teeny weeny inch a little bit more right here on this side. Would you please? Start from the outside. In some cultures, such matters are not left to chance. Girls who've reached an age where romantic encounters will soon become important are often drilled in ways of improving their all-important eye signals. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Sometimes the lengths we go to to accentuate the eyes reach a level of intensity more associated with the operating theater than the beauty salon. Nothing is too much trouble if we can encourage that all-important eye contact and, having gained it, can maintain it. Just as framing a painting helps us to view it more clearly, so framing the eyes by enlarging the eyelashes helps to focus attention where it's most needed. Mm. 
Beauty styles come and go, and the cultural value attached to different features varies the world over. But there are two qualities that have universal sex appeal. No culture is immune from them. I'm talking about signals of youth and health. Where sexuality is concerned, the younger and fitter a human adult is, the stronger the signals he or she transmits. It's all in the unlined skin and the flexibility of the movements. The young bounce and leap where their elders plod or droop. The bodies of the young seem strangely softer and lighter, as though the force of gravity is being unfairly kind to them. These are powerful sexual features that never fail to impress the eyes of the beholders. An unblemished skin is one of the few universal signals of sex appeal, since it reflects both youth and health. Cosmetics can improve this signal, but eventually something more drastic is needed. Early signs of change are where there's a little bit of descent and it begins to square off the lower part of the face. So that instead of being at an angle, it's a little blocked off. We just raise the brow as a separate thing to, a, to what's a pretty height and then trim any additional tissue that's left in there. These are two different approaches. It's not the one is better than the other. As we age, the facial skin becomes looser and more wrinkled until makeup alone is not enough. The answer then, if we wish to continue to transmit the powerful sexual signals of youthfulness, is cosmetic surgery, in which the facial skin is drawn back and tightened and the excess removed. This is not a procedure for the faint-hearted, and its growing popularity reveals just how much value is placed on these signals of youthfulness, particularly for the active modern female. I like the way it looks, though. When we do this kind of surgery, People will report that their friends say they look rested. But women are not alone in this. The urge to look young is one of the factors behind that strange male activity, face shaving. Many adult males the world over devote a considerable amount of time to scraping off their adult male badge, the beard. It's extraordinary to think that if a man spends 10 minutes a day on this task from the age of 18 to, say, the age of 60, that adds up to a total of 2,555 hours, or 106 days, out of his life. It's been said that shaving makes men look younger, healthier, and more expressive. All this may be true, but today the most important of these factors is undoubtedly the one to do with reducing age. The clean-shaven chin gives the male face a boyish look that helps to make its owner seem much younger than he really is. Or so he hopes. There are other, quite different mimics of youthfulness found among adults, and they're not confined to details of physical appearance. For instance, in every corner of the globe, couples indulge in the childlike activity of play fighting. During the early phases of pair bonding, fully adult humans perform acts of juvenile behavior as part of their courtship.
From country to country, male and female companions, in an identical fashion, transmit juvenile signals through sudden joyful outbursts of muscular playfulness. By presenting themselves to one another almost as children, they generate powerful protective urges, each for the other. Demonstrations of health are of value to any young adults who wish to advertise themselves as potential sexual partners. To this end, all over the world, in almost every culture, they can be found performing strange rhythmic movements in front of one another. They want to indicate their physical fitness, but without engaging in anything as competitive as sport. So they gyrate in front of one another, enacting symbolic locomotion that goes nowhere. We call it dancing. The energetic actions of the dancers suggest vigorous physical qualities that translate well into strong procreative potential. Now that war dances are almost a thing of the past, virtually all dancing right across the world is a symbolic version of human courtship with an undeniably sexual flavor, giving young adults the opportunity to assess one another's physical health, youth, and stamina. The dance movements may vary, the music may have a different sound, but everywhere the human message is the same. The differences that exist between male and female genitals are the source of many important sexual signals. Now, you may take this for granted, but you've got to remember that with a lot of animals, there is no such difference. There's a male aperture and a female aperture, and the two are brought together at mating, and that's it. But because the human male has a penis, this gives a possibility for all kinds of sexual symbolism. And because that penis, when it is aroused, becomes enlarged, that process of enlargement itself is also an important sexual signal. It leads to all kinds of male boasting about big penises. And if we move from the confines of the human body into the world of art, then we find that phallic symbolism and sculptural symbolism knows no bounds. There, the process of enlargement goes on and on, and we have enormous phallic displays. The cult of the phallus as a symbol of virility is known from the very beginning of the Neolithic period, about 10,000 years ago. Indeed, the phallus as a source of human life was considered so important that phallic worship became widespread. Today in Japan, 
Couples visit a shrine dedicated to the life-giving power of the penis. They make offerings and pray for children. Those whose prayers have been answered return to give thanks and leave notes testifying to the shrine's potency. This isn't a local oddity or a minor cultural quirk. Phallus worship is widespread. In Thailand, symbolic penises are garlanded and decorated with colorful silks, flowers, and other offerings. They're seen as objects of dramatic beauty, not obscenity, as they might appear to certain prudish Western eyes. In India, too, the ancient cult of the phallus, known here as the Lingam, has continued without interruption for centuries. Although the Indian lingam is less dramatic and less explicit in its detail than the fallacies of other countries, it plays an important role in everyday life. People may visit shrines several times a day to take part in elaborate ceremonies. The worship of the phallus, the source of generative power, the symbol of the Hindu god Shiva, must always be accompanied by libations and offerings and by the ringing of bells. No lingam can ever be moved from its sacred position. That would be an act of desecration. Once in position, it must remain there forever. Lingam shrines are a common feature on every street corner. In the West, such a statue could not be put on public display. There, it's acceptable to show a gun that shoots death, but not something like this that shoots life. Ironically, in the Philippines, it's a gun that plays an unexpected role in the creation of a most unusual phallic display. These fairground guns fire small plastic balls called bolitas. They're specially manufactured for firing on shooting stores, but they've now found a second, more extraordinary purpose. Inside this shabby building, a backstreet surgeon is preparing to cut open a young man's penis and insert a number of the plastic bolitas beneath its skin. Providing his hygiene is better than it looks, the operation should be straightforward enough and the inert nature of the plastic pellets means that they should, in theory, create no long-term problems. It's an operation that proves just how far some young men are prepared to go to improve their sex lives. After the insertions are completed, the surgeon then stitches up the penis which is left to heal over. After some time has elapsed, the new, improved penis will be covered in small, hard, protruding lumps. These will bring two rewards to their proud owner. They will provide extra stimulation for his female sex partners, and perhaps even more importantly, they'll add considerably to his sexual status among his male friends. Another form of sex appeal is the demonstration of courage. A popular form of this found all over the world is body mutilation. Here in Tahiti, for centuries, young males have subjected themselves to an excruciating form of body tattooing. And they've done this just to improve their appearance, to make themselves more appealing. Now, it follows from this, of course, that if they'll do that just to look good, then they will also be courageous and brave when protecting their mates and their families. And that's what gives it its sex appeal. Despite this underlying appeal, tattooed skin doesn't meet with universal approval. 
People are sharply divided over whether it increases sexual attractiveness or reduces it. Those who take a negative view are probably reacting to the way in which it interferes with that other basic response that finds sexual appeal in a smooth, clear, unblemished skin. For this reason, it's remained a minority display, although its occurrence is amazingly widespread. And it's certainly true that in those cultures where it's become entrenched as a social norm, the extent and painstaking complexity of the tattooing does give the men involved who patiently suffered long hours for their art, a special appeal for the local women. <laughs> All over the world, adult males devise special rituals in which their bravery can be demonstrated and many women find themselves sexually attracted to men who engage in dangerous occupations. In an unspoken way, it suggests that in an emergency, these are the men who would be courageous in protecting their families. The catch, of course, is that because of their bravery, they may be killed or seriously injured. Despite this, the sexual appeal of such life-threatening activities as motorcycle racing acts like a magnet for women who, once emotionally attached to their heroes, often spend their time trying to persuade them to give up the very activity that made them glamorous in the first place. Despite these flaws in high-risk activities, it has to be said that cowardice has never been sexy. A less direct way of performing a sexual display is to demonstrate some kind of high status. The high-status individuals can ignore the usual bodily signals and rely instead merely on a show of visible wealth and influence. One way of doing that is to own one of these Hollywood mansions here in Beverly Hills. The people living inside these magnificent buildings may be old and wrinkled or perhaps old and de-wrinkled, but it doesn't matter. Their appearance is not important. Their sex appeal comes from the promise that they offer to their loved ones of protective power. All over the world, expensive, flamboyant gestures are employed to reflect the lofty status of a suitor in the eyes of his potential partner. Here in Mexico, a young man who wishes to impress the object of his desire with his high status will pay an entire group of musicians, the mariachis, to serenade his beloved. It's the high cost of the operation rather than the music itself that really impresses her. <laughs> India. Inside this building, a modern beauty salon. But the treatment here has more to do with female status than with individual beauty. In India, high status is attached to a lifestyle that avoids working out of doors in the burning sun. So it follows that a paler skin is a badge of high status. Anything that can be done to lighten the skin tone artificially will help to reinforce a high status image. And so it is that here there's a thriving business in skin bleaching for those who wish to enhance their public display of social standing. This same status rule used to apply in Europe in earlier centuries. Only peasants worked out of doors, and so a pale skin was thought to be highly desirable. Aristocratic young ladies were told to keep out of the sun at all times. Then, in the 1920s, everything changed. With quicker forms of transport, it became fashionable to take vacations on the French Riviera. To prove that you could afford such a holiday, you had to return with something that had previously been forbidden, a suntan. Now everyone wanted to be golden brown, deeply tanned and bronzed. This became the new high status symbol for Europe and the Western world. And if you couldn't make the journey, you could always give the impression that you'd done so by toasting yourself on a sunbed.
So, in two different societies, high-status displays became the exact opposite of one another. And it's the same all over the world. Each culture has its own special rules, and it's easy to make mistakes as you travel from one country to another. You have to take the trouble to learn the local language of the sexes wherever you go. And this applies not only to status displays, but also to other kinds of social signals. This is the island of Malta, and here, like everywhere else, there are some intriguing regional examples if you take the trouble to look for them. In many cultures, there are specific signals of availability. Young adults may display the appropriate gender signals, but are they available for marriage? Now, when we lived in small tribes back in primeval times, there was no problem. Everybody knew everybody else. But then when those communities grew and grew and became huge, there was a serious problem. Some years ago, when I was living in the Mediterranean, I noticed that the older houses, like that one over there, had small stone brackets sticking out at the side. There's another one over there. And these stone brackets weren't just decorative, they had a special role to play as availability signaling devices. What happened was that if there was a virgin of marriageable age living in a house, then those brackets would be decorated in a particular way. When a young virgin living in this house reached a marriageable age, her family would advertise the fact by placing a pot of basil just there on that stone bracket. Basil is a plant symbolic of lovers. This would advertise to everybody walking past that there was a young girl in here ready to be wed. You might wonder why they went to such a lot of trouble. Why didn't she just go out and meet a boyfriend somewhere? Well, the answer is that in earlier days, she wasn't allowed out. In the strictest times of all, she would only be allowed out twice in her life, once to be married and once to be buried. The rest of the time would be spent behind these high walls. But there were generous courtyards and a whole world inside here in which she could live in safety and security. But of course, living like that, it was essential for her to have this kind of special availability display. Even when the rules were relaxed a little and she was allowed outside to go to church, she was required to conceal herself behind Malta's version of the veil, the all-covering faldetta. It was not only fearsomely dark and forbidding, it also managed to disguise her human shape and destroy any hint of female contours. It was a clothing display that positively shouted, keep back, keep away, to any passing male. It certainly left little doubt about the non-availability of the person wearing it. Signs of availability or non-availability can be found in many widely differing cultures. Even in the free and easy lifestyle of the South Pacific, young adults often display such signs. In the flower language of Tahiti, a blossom tucked behind the right ear signifies availability. One behind the left ear, above the heart, says, I'm not available, my heart is already taken. So, as we rise to adulthood in our various societies, we learn to speak the language of the sexes in a thousand different ways, telling one another about our moods, our fecundity, our virility, our status, our bravery, and our availability. Usually, we're cautious not to over-advertise ourselves. But on special occasions, as a relief from this self-control, we let rip. We abandon our restraints and pile signal on signal, display on display, for a moment of raucous celebration, putting the carnal back into carnival.
All over the world, different cultures have imposed their local dialects on the language of sex. Some have tried to suppress it, restrain it, and control it. Others have joyously exaggerated and amplified it. But one way or another, boy has had to meet girl, make love, and produce children. Out of sexual arousal, some kind of family life has had to grow. No matter how far societies go in distorting our basic human biology, they cannot interfere with breeding success or their cultures will vanish into the dustbin of history. And with 6,000 million of us still striding around on the surface of the Earth, it's clear that none of the many interferences has proved to be anything but trivial. What may happen in the future, however, with the advent of efficiently controlled genetic engineering is anybody's guess. But that, as they say, is another story.